I feel like I'm in the most authentic moment of my life. A, because I'm doing better than I ever had in terms of accountability and honesty and uh, keeping up my sobriety, which again has just opened loads of doors for me. Um, but also, I feel like I'm taking criticism and I'm being exposed to flaws um, in a better way than I ever have. Hi, I'm the self-development coach, Johnny Lawrence, and welcome to the Self-Development Podcast. On this episode, I have the pleasure of chatting with an incredible musician, best known as the live bass guitarist for Gorillaz, Shea Adelakam. For 15 years, Nigerian-born Shea has worked as a musician, writer, producer, and film scorer, and he's also performed, recorded, and written with artists such as Paloma Faith, Ellie Golding, Birdie, Mumford and Sons, Katie Tunstall, Noel Gallagher, and many, many more. His journey in life has taken some twists and turns, and he has had some highs and lows. And today we'll be discussing the learning that is taken from it all. How are you today, Shea? I'm all right. That's quite an intro, man. <laughs> oh, man I, I, I'm told I'm a good hype guy. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'd employ you to come on the road with me and just, uh, <laughs> just announce me everywhere. Uh, you know, um, no, thank you, man. I'm doing all right, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, you know, it's just somebody can't have the life that you had and not have learned some considerable things. Um, unfortunately, quite often, often it's the hard way. You know, I, I always say it. You know, the yeah. hardest parts of life are always on the, the the real learning is always on the other side of them really horrible experiences, and I don't know why that is, but it, it seems to be the case. Yeah, and I mean it you really do wish it was sort of the other way around but that would there's actually no way that you'd learn anything if things didn't get uncomfortable um but yeah no for sure I, I, but, uh, it's, i've had a great life and i've had a great career and although it, it's been peppered with you know troubles and issues etc i'm very lucky to say that i'm i'm still here number one um but there's I, I can actually say that even though there's been a lot of bad things mostly everything's kind of working out for the good so i kind of i'm still grateful for all the troubles yeah i, I mean i think sometimes those difficult situations as a matter of fact i was reading something the other day and they were saying that stress from different situations sometimes triggers something within the some within human beings that in order them mm. to develop they wouldn't develop in a certain way without that stress and i found that really quite interesting yeah. well i mean it makes it we literally see it in the gym or like, like with any exercise it's like your muscles don't grow unless there's trauma um mm. like the fibers have to be broken uh, otherwise there's no like your, your body doesn't feel like it needs to do anything um and i guess unfortunately it might be the same sort of emotionally and uh, mm. mentally it's like you need to go have like have resistance um resistance training um yeah. otherwise you're not going to get better and you don't really you don't realize the value of that until you're older like even when you're in your 20s it's like you still kind of you have all the feelings of a teenager but with the freedoms of an adult and mm. you haven't caught up to like your your freedoms are, are still you still think like a child and yeah. you're trying to uh you're trying to live and do life and it's like actually no um it, it, things catch up to you um yeah your 20s are a whole different ball game to what you think they're probably gonna be uh, they, they are though and, and i think like that's it your value systems change as well don't they as you get older the things that you value when you're 10 you don't value when you're 20 and 30 and so on and so mm. on and I think it, it's that it's it's recognizing. Like problem. <laughs> well, yeah, I tell you now, like looking at yeah, my yeah, ten yeah. year old, if I if I was still acting like that, I'd be in trouble I'm, or prison. One of, one of the two. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> just going around kicking things, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Just do whatever I liked because I could. Yeah. You know, it's just like, yeah, cool. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. I, I want to start like at the beginning, really, and. Um, mm. You know, you and I share a Nigerian heritage. Um, you know, you're you're from Nigeria. I'm not. I, I was born in the UK, but my dad was was native Nigerian. And cool. I just I just want to hear about your experience growing up because there's a especially in the UK amongst Nigerian um, families and stuff. There, there's banter in there. There's things that we all recognise is just part of 
having a Nigerian dad or Nigerian parents. And uh, some of it's funny yeah. and some of it's a bit less funny, you know, but I just wonder yeah. what your experience was like. Um, well, great. I, I, I'm very proudly, I'm half Nigerian, half Kenyan. So mum's from Kenya, dad's from Nigeria. They met, they met in the UK. So our family has uh, an affinity to this country, even though we, we traveled around a lot when I was growing up. So um, we kind of took Nigeria with us. Um, like the first place I remember I have any memories of were, were Holland because I moved there when I was two um was there till when I was six when I moved back to Nigeria to like when I was nine when I moved and then I moved to here then I did my sixth form in Ecuador and then I moved back um but there's something special about um I love Nigerians and I love I love where I'm from and uh but there is you know we definitely were a different family to wherever we were even in london it's like mm. we were nigerian family but we weren't from england so so there's also like a slight other otherness there as well yeah, yeah, um yeah. but in general in general it's been it's been a great great experience and I'm, I'm i'm really happy it it's also you know because my parents obviously culturally they grew up in Nigeria and kenya um they they had a much different life to the one I had, and they you know yeah. moved to other countries to get to give us lot their kids um, all these great opportunities. So I grew up very differently to my parents. So I I always found that there was a little bit of a disconnect in some ways. Like I always wanted to be really like my mates at school, um, but they had a very different relationship to their parents. Um, like the way they would talk to talk to them like and yeah. you know have this sort of quite colloquial relationship and it's like that was not the case in nah. my household or most other nigerian households you know what i mean like um did you call me by my first name it's like yeah you know i mean like what like yeah. you would say stuff certain things to your parents yeah. um but that's so that, that there was always some a part of me and also yeah, very christian upbringing as well um which again i'm grateful for but i'm not necessarily a believer um and that causes uh, tension. Yeah. Uh, in it, uh, not 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 necessarily. It's also you not necessarily that like uh, obvious tension, but it's just like there's an undercurrent of like, like I know what my parents want and what they expect, mm. and I know that I I think and feel other to that, but yeah. I still want to be honor like to honor them. And it's just like, oh, how do you live authentically as who you are? as well as honor your parents um yeah so that it's, it's like it's a it's a mixed one but i'm i've had a great life and a great upbringing and again there's there's been certain things that you know we think differently um on but the underlying thing is love and uh, mm. i couldn't be i couldn't be happier uh with that i got shown a good example i mean mum and dad have been together it's their 50th anniversary this year um so it was like they've they've been together for a long time uh and you know say i've got three brothers two sisters as well and like um all the same same family so uh again we're kind of an anomaly in that respect yeah no i mean it's it's actually really beautiful to hear because you're right you know it that isn't as as common as we'd like it to be you know mm. and uh I, one of the things that I know is quite prevalent in a lot of Nigerian families is that whole like strictness, that discipline. Mm -hmm. And and it's like, I remember you talk about like, you know, you wanted to be like your friends. I remember going over to a friend's house as a kid, right? And I'd not really done this very much. And I went over to a friend's house and I remember my mate saying to his like, his dad or his mum, one of them, um, oh, mum, I don't like this whatever she put in front of her and I laughed my head off because right? I thought to myself I can't even imagine I remember once maybe trying that on right saying to my dad oh, or my mum or whatever I don't like this and he just looked at me and he said yes you do <laughs> yes <laughs> yes you do I, was like, I, actually, okay. <laughs> I remember there was one like I went around to a friend's place when I was in primary school was it like year six or something and it was the first time I'd gone around to this person's house I'm not even saying their name um but we're playing like video games. I don't have to play video games. And he like, his mum was like, oh, we'll make you sandwiches. I was like, okay, cool. And like, after a little while, he shouts down and says like, where are sandwiches? I'm like, 
why are you putting me in this madness? I'm expecting her <laughs> to run up there with a rolling pin, but it was like all all right. But I was yeah. just like, you're about to get us both like yeah, yeah. murk. Bad like, things it was, about to it happen. Was hilarious. It's so funny. Yeah, but that's oh, it. It's, but, it's different. Yeah, it's, that, um, it's, it's that cultural thing, isn't it? It's, it's what I mean. I mean, with, with my life, it, it took a bit of a darker turn and, and I was subjected to some pretty nasty things uh, ultimately, which, yeah. um, you know, which where I stopped short of, of joking around it. But like you say, with these cultural differences, my, my dad was subjected to public flogging. So when I think about it that way, you know, yeah. like it's 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 not surprising he was the way he is. He doesn't give it a reason or excuse. It's just an understanding that I have because for me, if yeah. you want to move past difficult things, compassion is usually a good place to start. You know, which isn't always it's easy. So the only way, it's the only place. It's the only place. Um, again, I got having to deal with. Well, it's also the only place you can start with yourself as well. Like, because mm. uh, there's lots of, I've got lots of reasons to have lots of regrets and to have lots of guilt. And But the only way I've been able to move past some of it has been to kind of look back at that person and, you know, feel sorry for them and treat them like someone that you'd want to take care of. And uh, you have to be compassionate, not just with others um, and in particular people who hurt you, but with yourself. Yeah. And I think you, you hit the nail on the sure. head earlier when you said about, you know, sort of almost like you're always that child, you know, and it's the other people mm. that sort of tell you you're an adult. And it's like we're all we all find it so easy to be compassionate to children, don't we? But for some reason, yeah. like when it comes to an adult, it's like you should know better. Well, some adults don't, you know. Um, no, exactly. They, they just you don't. don't. Know their story. Yeah. No, no. Um, some, some people, you know, obviously we we respect sort of neurodivergence and mm. people with like different learning abilities etc um but you but in general say like a neurotypical adult person mm. it's like this number 18 you're 18 years old is an arbitrary number it's like it's not like you get activated that's when you come online it's like no some people need a bit more yeah. shepherding into adulthood yeah um I, I, well, I, was, I was listening to a podcast yesterday and it was with a police officer in the state saying he was 21 the first time he went out in LA in a squad car, shotgun in the back, gun on his hip, all the power of a police officer at 21 years old. And he was just like, you know, looking back on it, he's like, he thinks that's way too young mm. to g give that kind of power to someone. It's like, of course, like you, you're you've barely sort of gotten a license to be a full person. You've just been able to legally drink in the States to anyone. Yeah. It's like, and yet they want you to be an enforcer of the law. It's right. like, well, yeah. um, it's a that's big a ask. Lot. Yeah. It's a big ask. It's like, it's like, but I remember big. the feeling of like when my wife had uh, our first son, and I remember they were like, right, you can go home now. And I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> like, you want me to, you're going to leave us in charge of this? Yeah. No, I, don't, I don't know about that. Like, <laughs> I've just started, um, a bit later in life, I just started driving lessons. Um, okay. Well, actually, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like 20 hours in. Um, but my driving instructor, big up to Neville Silvera, big up, um, he explained some things, sat into the car, this is the first lesson, sat in the car, it's 20 minutes later, he's like, all right, well, you you know let's go i'm like whoa, whoa 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 like 20 minutes ago i've never done this before and there's real people on these streets mm. you're just like all right let's go like that's kind of getting launched into something like that mm. it's quite scary yeah but it speaks to what we were saying in the beginning it's like sometimes we need that stress to open that up don't we to 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 show you that you can do it to put you in a situation where you've got to adapt and evolve you know <laughs> and uh that 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 mm -hmm. sometimes mm -hmm. doesn't yeah like i met somebody once who um who told me a story about wanting to become a millionaire um and oh. a few years later they'd achieved it but they had to have a car accident in order to achieve it do you know yeah. what i mean it's like sometimes life doesn't go quite the way we want it to go we don't get where we want to go by the way we want to get there if that makes sense yeah yeah it can be yeah, which I think is a valuable lesson. I think that's kind of the sort of, the sorts of things that need to be taught in schools because mm. also there's again I'm not, I'm not one of these people who just like rags on the sort of education system because I think mm. even though in general the education system is kind of out kind of outdated, it doesn't cater to every different kind of learning and every different kind of person. Um, but we do a pretty good job in this country. Um, mm. 
but I feel like the sorts of things that should be taught, um, like you know, help with finances and all these yeah. other things that aren't really taught in schools, I think should, people should be taught to cook as well. Yeah. Um, but like you should be taught how to deal with things not working out because it's not like you know, you go to school, they're like, you know, get these grades, you go to this university, um, they hand you off and like it's like go ahead. Um, it's like, no, actually, you're probably most of the things you think are going to happen when you leave school are not um, or aren't going to happen the way that you want um, getting ready for disappointment oh. uh, and finding and not just not not just being like it's going to be disappointing it's like oh if this doesn't work out this is what you can do if that doesn't work out maybe this is what you can do or just give you the sort of teach people how to think like that kind of laterally um, just to, to work to to be able to flourish when things don't work out yeah. um i'm i'm really i'm particularly bad at that um and i'm really really i'm really really learning how to swerve um actually quite literally as well as i'm driving this and, <laughs> um but how to yeah, course correct um as we speak actually um yeah yeah one of the most difficult emotions to experience is disappointment Disappointment is um, is tied in with expectation, um, which is something that we do very naturally. And I think that disappointment is is really really difficult, and actually is 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 the reason why people do some of the really unkind things in life is through feeling disappointed. They 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 get angry because they're disappointed, but they mistakenly believe that the emotion they're feeling is anger when the anger is a reaction to the disappointment. So it's about yeah. understanding that you are disappointed. Um, and that it's an opportunity to be resilient because within that disappointment somewhere there's most likely an opportunity but that red mist stops you from seeing it do you know what I mean it's just very yeah. difficult very very difficult but I remember I heard a story once about this monk he sat in a room and he and he asked everyone in the room to tell them tell him about something that they felt they he, they didn't deserve and the mm. first person says you know last year I, I got cancer and I don't feel like I deserve that and the, the monk agreed and then the next person says, well, last year I had an accident and, and I don't feel like I deserved that. It was pretty bad. And mm -hmm. the monk agreed he didn't deserve it. And then the last person says, um, uh, last year I lost my mother uh, and I don't feel like I, I deserve that. And they said, no, no, it's, you know, everything you've said in this room, none of you deserve that. But I noticed that nobody said anything good. And it's, it, yeah, we, yeah. We, we have this relationship with, with life where we feel like all the bad things that happen, we don't deserve it. And all the good things we do, like if you win the lottery now, do you deserve that? I don't know. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. You know, but but then there's, <laughs> there, then there's the other part of it as well. It's like deserved. What what even is that? Like it's kind and of redundant. You, yeah, had you mentioned that? Yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of wild. It's like oh, I did I did X hours of community service, so I deserve yeah this. It's yeah. like there's no. Um, I think that's also like life isn't fair. Um, mm. and I feel like that kind of what the the, comp the complaint that a lot of people have about say um, my generation is that is that people do expect life to be fair or they want they want to make the world a fair place when um it's unfair it's unfair in general um yeah. but it does yeah, people do forget that it does also count in your favor yeah like it's not just unfair in a bad way like it's unfair for, for a lot of people in a good way it's like mm. oh what why should i get the privilege of living in a certain place or having certain opportunities in life over somebody else who's also a human being like didn't ask to be born yeah <laughs> like yeah. what gives me that that privilege over somebody else it's like um every way you look there's reasons to be you know say feel down about things but there's also reasons to feel good and actually that that takes me to and i'm probably skipping ahead from a question some questions you've got but it's one of the biggest lessons i learned in rehab um was like I had to do like a sort of a, an audit of my life and an audit of myself and be really really painfully objective about my faults my flaws all the terrible things mm. I've done but to be it to have an objective look at yourself you also have to look at all the good things that you are and the good things that you've done and actually that was a really that was actually sometimes harder to be like oh you're not just a terrible person oh you're not just this that and the other actually you're good at this actually mm. you treat that person really well actually you try hard at this blah blah blah. or actually you're in rehab you're doing you're doing summer you know 
um, trying to be a look at life, look at the objectively bad things in life, but also try and pull out and see the good things that are going on. It's really hard, but I think it's really beneficial. It, it is. And and it, that sort of circumnavigates that whole, like, which again is a very difficult way to look at things is that victim mentality. It's just mm. so easy to lean into because that language of like, I don't deserve this, that, that will keep you there. And it's really difficult. And what people don't realize, especially when you, you've had experiences of addiction is that it's really hard to want to change it's yeah. like, that's the hard bit you have to really want to do it and uh, yeah. not and a lot a lot of people will understand it unless they do and that is that that's really difficult to get to a point where you actually want to take accountability for your life and say right mm. I, i've messed up here and i need to do better and and i've heard you say it in other interviews like that there's aspects of your life that you regret that you can't amend for you you can't you can't change and, you can do. and and it's hard that's that's really difficult that's so difficult like to to have those it's unfair yeah exactly it's unfair and you don't deserve it and they didn't deserve it and you know all that sort of stuff and it's like that's where you have to get to one of the most difficult lessons in life and that is acceptance you have to find yeah. a way to accept it which is hard it's so hard and that's actually that's actually one of the hardest that's just made me think one of the hardest things about getting better was actually feeling like, yeah, all those people that didn't deserve things mm. and say are probably still hurting or some things are still, it's just like, and I'm here feeling better. Mm. Like that was really hard. It's just like, oh, the guilt, now feeling guilty for feeling, feeling better, for feeling better. It's like, oh, that was really it's really complicated that one yeah no it is and it's deep man and it's it comes down to those judgments we make um of everything you know i talk about how people can think a feeling into a problem so you can have a feeling and that feeling mm. can be difficult that feeling can be mm. i don't know loneliness for example and it's so mm. easy for someone to go from lonely to I'm lonely because I've got no friends I'm got no friends because I'm worthless yeah. I'm worthless what's the point and it's like they've gone from lonely to worthless to what's mm -hmm. the point in, in a short amount of time because mm -hmm. they, they attached to that and they thought about it and they thought that feeling into a problem mm -hmm. when actually sometimes difficult feelings are just difficult feelings, you know? And, and temporary. And temporary if you let them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. Which is really yeah, hard. I mean, most do. feelings are. Most yeah. feelings are temporary. Um, yeah. Again, that's a, sobri a sobriety thing. It's like temptations and uh, feelings things are cravings etc it's like mm. all of all of them pass if you can just hang in there which mm. i think becomes one of the skills um the difference one of the main differences between a sober person and a, and a, someone who's still say struggling with addiction etc um is i'm i've learned how to delay feeling x and acting upon it yeah. um and within that that time it fades but it's like obviously when you're in the depths of an addiction um, or any sort of compulsive behavior, um, you have to do it immediately. Mm. Like the time between like you needing it. And the same, you, you can see it when someone say they, they're a drinker and then yeah, they just drink on the weekends. Oh, and then they just drink in the evenings and then they just drink um, all day. Oh, they, they start to drink at work. They, then it's actually, eventually you wake up and you drink the time between you getting up and it actually happening just gets less and 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 less um and actually what you're trying to do when you're sober is just keep those gaps wide um because yeah. the feeling is going to come i think that's one of the issues that again one of the things about that people misconstrue about sobriety or recovery that they assume that once you're in recovery, the feelings don't, the feelings go away or <clears throat> like these pressures still go away. It's like, no, actually the problem is actually, or the, the skill and the strength is actually being able to deal with those things mm. and not, act, not use those old methods of mm. soothing and those old methods of getting through those feelings. Um, it's like, no, actually just being able to sit in it and sit with it. Um, like, of course those feel like, you know, there's like adverts for drinking every single day and like all the time. It's yeah. like, what well, am I not going to think about it? Of course, I'm going to think about it. Yeah. But I'm just not going to, you know, go buy a six pack. 
Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, there's um, a reason why they call like a sober reality because it, it is about just not falling yourself. You know, what we, what we look to is to find a pause before that compulsion to avoid. Do you know what I mean? And, and that's mm-hmm. what that's what we do. We as addicts, we we found a way to avoid a difficult emotion. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. it's like we lean into that, like you know. And the way I look at it, it's like you know, one of the things that I think you speak to on pow- powerfully about is like becoming authentic. And it's that mm-hmm. authentic self against that conditioned self. And it's like that that conditioned self has learned a mechanism to avoid uncomfortable feelings. It's found a coping mechanism, and that's alcohol. And what I think people mm-hmm. get a bit unkind to themselves about is that that they, they they don't if they don't know another way of dealing with that difficult emotion, then of course they're always going to go back to that method of self soothing, because that's yeah. all they know. <laughs> you know, and you can't blame again. You can't blame all people for no, no. that being the only outlet. Again, I, like. I mean, when I was in rehab, I heard some stories from people who had the most horrific things happen mm. to them when they were really young, etc. And it's like, of course, that's that became your own you, the way you learned how to soothe when you were a kid because you know your parent was feeding you drink when you were a kid. It's like, of course, mm. that was the way out. It's like, um, yeah, try not to, to judge why it starts. Like, why it starts is almost irrelevant. Oh yeah, because there's like it could be a because it's different for each person. There's no that if there was like a set reason why these things start, we would have society would have weeded these things out by now. Like we would have been over it. Um, so there's there's an endless amount of reasons why um, addictions start in people. Um, who knows if there's actually any way of avoiding it starting in the first place? Um, what's what should be more important is like okay, you are you're in trouble let's just help you as opposed to um casting judgments or uh, having to nitpick i mean you know i think you mentioned it briefly before we started um recording um but there's been abuse in my life um i don't go i don't talk about it i don't go into it because it's still very very painful um but who knows whether that is actually one of the reasons why like i haven't i didn't document my feelings from the age of like six to now mm-hmm. as to oh when this thought comes up i'm thinking about this blah blah um it's just part of the big stew of things that are my life um it reminds me of a story i heard and they told us in rehab which is probably i think just a famous thing but it's like but these two women um their, their father was an abusive alcoholic um drug addict um one of them ended up being a you know high successful lawyer um and the other one ended up as a as an addict as well and the lawyer was asked why how come you turned up so you know well you know so like, well, my dad was an abusive alcoholic and they asked the addict how come you turned out the way you did it's like well my dad was an abusive alcoholic um it's like it, it what whatever your cards are dealt things can turn out differently um and sometimes it's a choice you can make sometimes it's not yeah and and another way to look at that is they're both forms of addiction you know one got addicted to work the other one got addicted to drugs and it it, but the but the need the need was still the same and that was avoidance escape get away from it you know um and uh Mm -hmm. yeah it's a powerful story Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. i've heard something similar to that before I mean, we're going to get round to the addiction stuff in a minute. We kind of hit the ground running. This is what, this is, we, you know, we hit it off when we met at Dave's party, didn't we? <laughs> at Sober Dave's party and we are talking about Yeah, it yeah um, man. Big up Sober Dave. <laughs> yeah, that is a lot of fun, Sober Dave. Um, uh, so what I wanted to talk about just before we got into addiction was, like, again, going back to culture, is like, how do you feel that culture has impacted your life? Because I know you've spoken before about incidents of racism and all that plays into your sort of perception of the world, doesn't it? It has to, really. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've always had a, for example, my, my name's Shea, um, which I mm. now really like. My full name's Olua Shea, um, but my name's Shea. For example, growing up, I always wanted to have just a straightforward western christian name because like again i went to a british school in holland um so obviously all my friends were but it was an international school um 
and again kids kids are gonna tease and you know i was always first in the register um so my name was always the first to be butchered <laughs> um by whoever the teacher was so there was always this sort of othering again like not just the fact that you know i was an african kid uh in an all-white school um in holland in the early 90s so it's like it was there was a lot going on um but then even when i went back to when i moved back to nigeria after being in holland i came from a british school in holland and i'd never really experienced nigeria so they were they were they were teasing me saying like i was putting on an accent it was like mm. what who's this weird kid because i was culturally european or red, like with more so than i was kind of as like Nigerian as they were, um, which also became a, like a bit of a thing. And then I moved to England when I was a kid, and my like it was night. It was Christmas ninety seven, I think. I, um, and I think share. Do you believe in life after love? Big tune around that time, and like that big things that could just say what like share the singer like about my name etc. Like I've always, I, it took a long, long, long time for me to just want to to be okay with my name, you know. Um, but that's just one example of how, say, just being culturally slightly, sort of different to those I grew up around makes you feel, again, uh, the word other, like just sort of, mm. yeah, it, it feels like a big thing and it becomes a big thing. Um, around you but also one but one of the great things about that was like I would go home and nothing would be strange so it's like there was always a refuge at home um in a way and even though I'd spend you know, the day maybe thinking I want I wish I could change this I wish you know I wish I had straight hair I think every sort of black person well a lot of people as kids growing up have that sort of thought well when you grow up in a white area um like people just touching your hair, like the weirdest, <laughs> the weirdest compulsion I've seen in sort of people. Yeah, it's just right. like being like, can I, not just can I touch your hair? Cause I actually don't necessarily mind somebody asking because it's like, that that makes way more sense to me than someone just doing it or doing it and just saying, oh, that's that's really weird. It's just like, this isn't a zoo, bro. Like yeah. get off my head. Um, like it's wild isn't it it's yeah, so wild no, yeah, um, right, and right. that happens that happens today it's not this isn't the past this is like mm. it still happens um but again there's there's but there's always there's just always something there's a resilience and there's there's always a safety in community there's like always there's someone to talk to about it and my you know um yeah there's, there's there is that as well so it's like culture's been there's no getting away from it no um in a in, in in a good way but i also kind of look forward to a day when it's all like not that all cultures become homogenous or anything yeah. but it's just like it becomes less of a thing <laughs> yeah i mean i i wonder i wonder like did, did you ever feel sort of like this feeling of not being accepted as a kid, like, especially when you were at school, did you ever feel like you, you know, you were different, but like that, that was it. You were over there. They were over here. Did you ever have that feeling at all? So a mixture of things, a, I had that feeling, but mm. then eventually I, I worked out how to counter that feeling by becoming a really good mimic. So mm. I pick mm. up whatever accent I was around extremely quickly. Um, I started singing and you know well in fact I was singing at home like music music always came naturally um so I got into performing I think one of the reasons was to well I've got no other social currency um I'm not I'm not athletic I'm a bit of a you know geek and I'm the invariably the only black kid around um so I need some other kind of social currency so just performing just came easy so I could just project confidence and um and there's and being good at something I, which again i'm not tooting my own horn but just because of the household i grew up in and, and again going to church every weekend being surrounded by music playing music singing constantly etc um things in terms of performance and music etc always came 
came quite easily. I did it quite well from a young age. So I at least could all feel, get some sort of confidence from that. Mm. Um, and so it's like, initially I, I, I can be othered in other respects, but I can at least be admired in one. Um, mm. And that really, really helped. You know, that was my initial sort of, probably my original soothing method um, to get up and perform and be, be the star. Mm. Um, I'm also the youngest of six. So I'm, I am, a, I have an affinity for being an attention seeker. <laughs> um, but yeah. every, everything else on top adds. To be fair, though, I just want to say, I think at this stage in your life, you can say you're very good at it. So <laughs> I think that, that's not really I an suppose. ego thing. I think at this point, you've kind of earned it. <laughs> you know? yeah, I, but, I, I'm a professional now, I guess. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, I love your use of the word social currency there. You're right. It's like you found a way to sort of trade whatever for attention or um sort of admiration whatever it is which is what all kids want it's not exclusive to you or me it's no it, it's what all, all kids want to to be liked or, or want to be accepted in society and when mm -hmm. you have this thing that is seemingly not accepted by other people that's difficult and I love the way that you've made that yeah. association of like you know I had to find some form of currency because currency sort of suggests value doesn't it it suggests like, hey, I need, yeah. I've need, i got to be of value to other people somehow. I'll try this. I'll try being the funny person. I'll try being the tough person. And there's certain things that just weren't available to us. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, like you know, I was never no. going to be seen as athletic as a kid. It wasn't happening. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And I, I was never going to be the hot, you know, the one who is all the girls fancy. Do you know what I mean? Like, I literally have had girls go, uh, like, yeah, I've had that. To, to me <laughs> in the face. It's like when they've been, you know, when people put you together to kiss and stuff, it's like, there's, there's going to be other ways. And I think this is, all, again, talking about the school system. One of the things that sort of kind of doesn't sit well with me in terms of, or one of the things that I think maybe you, you might miss out on with homeschooling, for example, or, which again is a completely valid, cool way of uh, being brought up, et cetera. But it's like these social, it's not even just like making friends and having like, positive social experiences it's like actually the playground is a microcosm of all kinds of social activities and hierarchies and all of these things and like having to sort of deal with those which is which again is hard like going back to what we're talking about mm. having some sort of resistance to get through I mean those things were the building blocks of my eventual career mm. um the mixture of that and the mixture of you know my thankfully wonderful upbringing at home um, and the environment at home um but like you're saying like the um you know the tough like t being the the tough guy end up being the funny guy just trying to get make it through the um the playground or make it through lunchtime a, a lot of those people end up having those things being their actual jobs yeah, <laughs> um yeah. these things that are developed in you know the the playground lab laboratory um so there is, uh, I, I also have to find some reason to be grateful for a lot of these things because um, number one, I'm grateful for having traveled a lot and growing up, that's also given me a lot of um, skills. And I, I early on got used to being in different situations. I'm very comfortable in new places. I'm very comfortable in new countries, very comfortable meeting people for the first time. Uh, like I've got no problem all, and all of those things, even though sometimes they were uncomfortable as a kid. Like, oh, why do I have to move? oh, I really like this place or whatever. It's like, well, actually, you learn to adapt to that and it's actually become a really good skill. And I ended up, you know, I'm a touring musician yeah. a lot of the time. So it's actually literally fed in directly to being a part of my job. Yeah, and that's got to be valuable for you because a lot of that stuff you talk about, it, that can be the make or break for some people. I've known people that have had really great sporting opportunities but as soon as they realized that how much travel was involved in it they just started mm. going the other direction and it's a real shame because they were a talented athlete you know mm -hmm. um one one of the things i heard you mention in a previous interview was that like music became <clears throat> a form of emotional expression for you and i absolutely love that i gave gave me goosebumps because some people at school or in life they need to talk, you need to go to therapy, they need to do whatever, but you seem to get what you needed from music. And I thought that was really lovely. Well, it, it again, it's, it's not necessarily a, a black thing, but 
I don't know, maybe it is, but there's there's something I grew up every night. Uh, we're a Christian family growing up and every night we'd sing. We'd read the Bible, we'd pray and sing as a family, basically six nights a week till I was 18. Mm-hmm. Um, so like we'd have songbooks from church. Um, Dad would get his guitar out. Um, they'd be picked, you know, three or so songs um, to sing um, from the songbook. And it's like, there was something really magical about that. Um, like, I, that's how, that was actually my, the building got to me learning to say music theory, because like my, my brothers and sisters and mum and dad, they're all good singers, um, singing different harmonies and all this mm. stuff. And it's just like, there's, there's something really connecting with, there's something really connect bonding with singing with anybody anyways, but like singing with your family all the time mm. was just like such a, no matter what happened in the day, that was always kind of a great, it would just always make me feel better. Um, and even sometimes I remember it's like stalking, like at the beginning, because I didn't want to do it. It's just like, I just want to like be up playing video games or whatever. But like my dad all up being like, it's time to read the Bible or whatever. Um, and I'd be like, Whoa, and like sort of stomp, take my time, stomp down the stairs. And as soon as you start singing, it's just like, more. this is dope. And I'm really here for it. Um, and that sort of music became a comfort. It became um, joy. It became, there was you no, know, everything was all right in that bubble for mm. at least that little period of time. Um, and it's kind of stayed the same ever since. Um, there's always been ways of expressing, like, for example, I'm not a very, like, I'm not very athletic. I'm not very tough. I've never, never really been in a fight. Um, a, because I just avoid them like the plague. And B, I just don't bring that out of people. No, fair um, <laughs> but say if I'm playing music, like when I was in, a lot of the music I got into as a kid was really like quite heavy music. Um, and I can be brutal and aggressive and like atonal and uh, frustrated and all this stuff on the guitar far more than I could ever express it on my face or ever express it in words or... Um, with sort of physical domination but it's like if you give me a guitar i can and uh, plug it into a, an amp or through a pa system i can make you sound make it sound like the world is about to it um it's like oh sweet this thing lets me do all of these things that i can't do otherwise i'm not i'm not like a i was never like a popular like smooth guy with girls etc when i was growing up and um but if you give me a guitar put me on stage it's like this is the, it's a level playing field or mm. actually dare i say i've got an advantage um or even like fun, like funny things are funnier like can hit differently when they're in a song or yeah. like um it it just became and and still is and i'm still learning obviously every single day um like luckily i work with some amazing songwriters and i know some amazing songwriters um I mean, three of the people I, you know, I'm going to name, do it as a heavy name drop, but uh, three of the people I'm lucky enough to call friends and work with um, often, so Damon Albarn, Paloma Faith, and Katie Tunstall, extremely different songwriters, but listen to any of their music and it's just a direct line into how they're feeling. Um, And that's not to say that all their songs are necessarily deep because... Mm let's get up and dance is just as valid a feeling as you know baby why do you let leave me do you know what i mean mm, yeah, yeah. um like and also damon who's i think the king of making like seemingly silly lyrics really meaningful and like he can write songs with basically no lyrics um if you listen to a lot of gorilla songs there's not really actually much being said um literally just mumbling into a you know microphone um but the feeling is there and yeah. the production is there and the, the, the melody ideas are there. Um, so I, I, I'm still, I'm still learning how to express myself as truly as possible, because again, there's a vulnerability there. If you get really honest with yourself, and if you get really honest with the music, um, it's way easier. I found it easier to do actually when I was younger, mm. um, because it's almost like this necessity. There was a necessity um, sort of socially, but also just, personally i just like you are a bit like a runner when you're 14 um, there's, a, there's a lot less conditioning as well isn't there 
you know exactly yeah yeah there was there was i was just sort of doing yeah. um and then as soon as you start putting like oh this is my job or yeah you, know, you just get a bit older and you see like oh actually maybe these people expect me to write this kind of thing so i'm gonna lean into that or yeah. oh yeah. i need to be more like this or or stuff like oh i need to write stuff with more beat because i'm black do you know what i mean like yeah no yeah, mad, yeah things that come into it it's just like as opposed to when i was 16 and just writing and loving it and yeah. these things just sort of came out um, yeah, it's like a curiosity and a purity as well it's the sort of words that come into my mind when you're saying that you know mm-hmm. yeah you're right curiosity and purity are are about as important words to describe or, or should be probably the most important words to a musician um more so than i don't know production value more so than um more so than anything else like mm. curiosity and, and again the the thing that is uh true of all of those three people i mentioned before is that they are endlessly curious mm. yeah i mean curiosity is the ultimate thing you see it in children you see it in animals it's that curiosity, that willingness to take a risk in a way, because mm. curiosity comes with a risk, doesn't it? You know, if you're curious what's around the corner, you're either going to like it or not, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's the unknown. It's yeah. like, that's what, you know, you're not curious about things that you are well trodden. You're not curious no. about things that you know. I'm not curious about what's going to happen when I, about the layout of my flat. I know yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, with with any form of like exploration or stepping into new places, there is a risk, and you know humans by nature are risk averse. Mm. Um, some more than others. I naturally am. Oof, I don't like it at all. I try to keep myself as you know protected and you know small and sheltered as possible. Um, in a lot of respects, anyways. I say, I say that I do like a very sort of high pressure kind of mm. mad job. Um, but yeah, it expresses itself in different ways. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I, I feel like that's a nice little segue onto talking about our experiences or your experience with addiction because, you know, you, you talk about that risk aversion and, and people always refer to when people um, fall off the wagon, they say, oh, you know, get back on the straight and narrow. But I was speaking to a client the other day and they were saying, see, the straight and narrow for me was being addicted because I, yeah. I knew when I was going to get a drink and I knew I had my <laughs> whole day planned out. So to them, yeah. the straight and narrow is not something they want to go near, <laughs> you know? No, it's, it's, you know, you're right. That's a good way of putting it actually, because it's life is completely, un, mostly unpredictable. It is. Like yeah. there was something really reassuring about knowing at the very least today, I'm going to get high. I'm going to mm. have a few drinks. Um, if I'm not, and also I could do that anywhere. If I'm not doing it here, I, I can do it in a different country. I can do it in a different part of London or you know like there was there was a comfort in knowing and you know even though at the end it became well it's like a black hole it just you know you just become insular and you turn you become alone and it's it's horrendous mm-hmm. um but even to a certain extent it's a social thing so like oh I'm going out and seeing my friends who probably may, may not may not be your real friends but you know you're seeing people you feel you know, things that can make you feel like you're doing something actually quite good, you know. Yeah. If you're someone like me who's a musician, um, I'm drinking and I'm working. So it's not like I'm not even working. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean, it's that yeah. Yeah. if not, if anything, it's expected in a lot yeah. of, like, so a lot of people see what I do and, you know, approach what I do is just like, well, yeah, they want to see kind of someone who's a, in leathers who's a bit sort of tattered. Um, we call it junkie chic. Um <laughs> Never heard that before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, yeah, it's way, it's way more stressful. And like being on the straight, the straight and narrow is like there's responsibilities there. You have to reply mm. to letters coming through the door. Mm. You have to be responsible. You have to be mm. accountable. You have to pick up the phone. Mm. Um, and and on top of that, you don't necessarily know what's going to happen when you step out of that door. Um, yeah, but. 
I think that's the illusion, isn't it? Like we kid ourselves into believing that there's surety in life, that we know what's going to happen. But the truth of it is life is completely unpredictable. Like just then, like for, we're, we're letting it out. But uh, <laughs> our, our Wi-Fi just cut off and we yeah. didn't expect that to happen. And it did, you know, it's, just the yeah, way yeah, it yeah. Goes. It's, it's, it's life. This is what happens. But I mean, like you, you've been through an addiction journey and mm -hmm. um, I've often seen that it's the conflict between someone's authentic self and their conditioned self that that really causes the struggle in addiction mm -hmm. so i mean do you feel like you're living as your authentic self now or closer to it way closer to it like it's it's so strange because a lot of the things that i thought wouldn't would go away or i thought if i stop if i got sober i'd have i'd be giving up a lot of things um so not obviously just the the drugs etc it was like Am I going to be able to talk to people? Am I going to be as sociable? Am I going to be good at playing music anymore? Like all of these things, um, mm. I was really scared of. Am I going to be as creative? Am I going to have fun anymore? And all of these things that I thought were going to go actually have been turned up. Like I'm way, I'm way, way more creative. And if anything, now I have, now that I sleep more and I have access to all all of my faculties way more, I actually could, I'm, I'm so much, I'm so I'm busier than I've ever been because, like in the morning I could say do a podcast with you, then in the afternoon I'll go do a voiceover job because I've got now I've got a voiceover agent, and then I'm going to go do a music gig, and then somebody emails me something, I have to like consult on the film score or something, and then I go off and do styling for some so somebody else and like link somebody with another creative because they need a hat for something and um and then meet my mates and then have dinner with my girlfriend and it's like I could only do like one I had like about three workable hours in a day before when I was getting smashed yeah. like if that it's like I didn't I couldn't do any of these things I have such a, a bigger capacity for things obviously with that comes there's there's a wider gate for rubbish to get in <laughs> um like there's there's now all this there's all of those things are opportunities but all those things are also extra stressors i have to keep my schedule a lot tighter i have to make sure that i get try and get some sleep I'm not really sleeping recently but that happens um you have to be accountable you have to turn up on time you have to you know keep money uh well again all my money went on getting getting on it like i wasn't paying rent and all this stuff it's just like oh now i can you know i've got my phone to pay for i've got sort of a storage unit to pay for i've got rent to pay for there are all these things that are stressors but i can handle all of it way way more and obviously you're a human so things will be stressful stress stress is gone stress it's like it's yeah, not that's, stress that's does not life yeah yeah it doesn't diminish but it's like oh I'm, i've got the capacity to deal with it and that's not to, but it's also not to say that i'm perfect and i'm um there are still things i'm being i'm working on being authentic with myself with you know, um, I've done a lot of work. That rehab was, you know, it was 10 months residential um, at this uh, facility, a place called Teen Challenge at Willoughby House. Um, 10 months, no phone, no TV, no internet. Um, and then another six months, still on the program, but off, off site. I was at my parents' place. Um, it was actually when the pandemic hit. So I was there for a good year after that. Um, and you know therapy since and lots of what you know lots of work is, has gone on and i'm still working on things and i'm still learning new things new triggers um new feelings it's like oh right i feel i didn't realize i felt that about this like um i'm not going to go into it but i had a really frank and really good conversation with my girlfriend and uh yesterday and it really held a mirror up to behaviors of mine that i was not I wasn't even necessarily aware I was doing. And it's one thing that um, I think I learned a phrase that came up in rehab that I, I live by, or I think about all the times that your behavior doesn't lie. Mm, um, yes. And it's like, and it's like, it, it was literally just a list of different things. And I was just like, oh, right. That's actually one of the things of who I am. And that's, that's again, that's good and bad. It's mm. not just, it's, I'm not just talking about bad things here. Um, but it's like how, you know, love, love being a verb, for example, it's like, if you love someone, it actually doesn't necessarily matter if 
you say it as long as you show it oh and you can show it in so many ways and that can that that's different per person etc but as long as you're showing it in some actual real tangible way if i love you means a text every now and then saying um make sure you remember your phone charge when you go out um, yeah having, you know having food you know what food yeah. on the table when somebody gets mm. in or um you know taking the bins out i love you is a is a really yeah. practical thing that thankfully is an equal opportunity sport anybody can show that they love someone um and it, it you don't have to do grand gestures and no. it doesn't have to be all these things it can just be consistent being consistent yeah. um it's an attitude it's an isn't it love. is yeah. it like put put your seatbelt on it's an act of love you know, for sure. Like, because if is. you don't put your seatbelt on, it's like it's that's not good, is yeah. it? <laughs> but but also, but then also, depending on the person, because actually, if this person always puts their seatbelt on, and you sit in the car and you say, "Put your seatbelt on," mm. as if like, then it's like then it's weapon, you know, weaponized, yeah. and it's yeah, like, that's oh, the shoot. Point. Yeah. Um, so it's like obviously there's there's what comes behind it also, and also you know buying somebody something mm. because you're trying to cover up some other thing that you've done mm. and also be like oh actually but if you lay it all out there, there'll be an overarching behavior and it's like i feel like you can tell you could tell how somebody feels about you by the way by the way they treat you and your instincts tend to be pretty pretty bang on so it's mm. like i i feel i feel like i'm in the most authentic moment of my life a because i'm doing better than I ever had in terms of accountability and honesty and uh, keeping up my sobriety, which again, has opened loads of doors for me. Um, but also I feel like I'm taking criticism and I'm being exposed to flaws um, in a better way than I ever have. Um, oh, yeah. And that also comes from being surrounded by honest people. I've got a fantastic girlfriend who's honest with me. Um, and that that really helps, but also I have to be able to receive it. And I think um, I'm really proud, even though I'm not I'm not necessarily dealing with it that well. I'm really proud that I'm able to at least hear it, and I'm I'm really internalizing it and working out what that means. Yeah, I mean sobriety um, is a is a process, and it's a bit like I heard this proverb once, and it said, "Dad, every year you get smarter and smarter," and it's obviously not the dad; it's the kid's awareness. And I think that's that's yeah. that's kind of what happens with sobriety. Like, uh, you know, as you move through the years, you become more and more aware of the next step and the next stage, and you're more open to certain things because you're you've moved through a certain phase. And I I, I yeah. know for myself, like, um, what I ultimately got from sobriety is freedom. Like, mm. like I don't think people realize that the level of pressure, right or wrong, right, without judgment, the level of pr pressure and commitment that somebody has to their addiction and how much it absorbs their thoughts. And then mm -hmm. they circumnavigate guilt and shame all the time because they know that this time they're spending with their addiction, they're not spending with other people or other things that deserve as we use that word deserve uh, even more and it becomes a real trap because it is self-perpetuating isn't it it's like you know yeah and it's all it's all consuming eventually oh it is like it i think be. i think you don't realize and there's a scale i mean i think where where you think that you have a problem is also quite individual it's just like you could just be having a few drinks a week but if it's affecting your life in a, in a certain way, it's like, that's as much a problem as me smashing a bottle or three every day. Um, it doesn't think people need to know that there isn't like a certain amount that you have to drink or take whatever drug to be addicted or to, to have a problem. It's like invariably it's how it affects your life and how it affects you. Um, yeah. It's to totally case by case and totally, uh, individual but i think you what is common though it's like those three drinks a week are going to be if they're on that person's mind mm -hmm. the entire week that's a whole different thing it's just like um it just becomes like where most of your energy comes from or like those three drinks a week they that ends up making them feel guilty for yeah. the rest of the four the next four days until they wait till they have those three and it's just like well actually if that's your relationship with drinking as opposed to having a glass of wine every now and then, or if you're cap 
I mean, I even think counting them can sometimes be an indication of a problem. I'm just going to have three. I'm just going to have three. I'm just going to have three. Like it constantly just like, I can't afford, I can't afford, yeah. as opposed to someone just has one every now and then, or sometimes just doesn't have one. But Do you know what you've hit upon there is absolutely brilliant because you're right. It's like, because that's what that was the confusion that people have with me that when I when I told people like, you know, I, I, I've got a problem with alcohol, they they were like, no, you haven't. I'm like, but yeah, you might have seen me drink three mm-hmm. pints, right? But you don't mm-hmm. understand. I've been thinking about that since 12 o'clock. <laughs> I, haven't, yeah. I haven't done and I haven't done anything with my kids. I haven't done any of this. Yeah, I have, yeah. Like I've been in my mind. I've been drinking all day. You know, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah, I've been yeah, doing. Yeah. And, and I've never really thought of it like that. You're right. It's, it's how much of your time you're imprisoned by this addiction like it's all you think about um because it 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 gives you something and that's that I suppose that's what what's ultimately there to be understood is like what does it give you what does that Mm. alcohol give you ultimately because the trick to it is if you can find a way to give that thing to yourself without alcohol then the alcohol just gives you up because it doesn't have a purpose yeah. anymore. It doesn't have a reason yeah. to do it. It doesn't make, but you, you know, what you've just said there is, is so true. Like, you know, you can have three, three drinks in the evening, two bottles of wine. It's kind of redundant. It's the fact that you've been thinking about it all day, you know, and, is... and just can all consuming. But also I like what you said about like, when you told your friends and that, that has been the, re- I've, I've experienced that reaction as well sometimes. And it's like, you say, I've got a problem with mm. drink and they're like no what no you haven't mm. it's like well it's my relationship it's my problem with drink it's yes. like you you, you go and it, it's funny how we feel like it's we all participate in this together it's like actually everybody you don't necessarily you haven't seen the drinks that i had before i got here you don't you're not going to see the drinks i'm going to have when i get home yes yes um and it's it's that was one of the uh thankfully i've got an, an amazingly supportive uh family group of friends partner that all the artists that i work with all the bands that i work with everybody's super 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 um supportive but there were there were definitely some people that either found out or are told that i've got you know i'm in recovery or gonna rehab or i'm in rehab or blah blah um they're just like what like you're fine like oh you should just you should have just called like we could have just like you know actually no i've got i'm thinking about knocking on the head of us just like um or the people just like i'm not drinking like you know who sober shame you and it's just like yeah, yeah. that says a lot more about them and says a lot more than than it says about you so um which again was one of the actual biggest one of the things i thought about the most was like seeming lame like i really didn't want to be that guy who's just like because i was you know coming from the mindset of a drinker if someone wasn't drinking and they came out i'm like why are you here yeah, like yeah. what is the actual point um yep <laughs> as opposed to just being like they can do what they want they want to see they want to be out with their friends you know they don't have to get smashed mm. um but i thought i thought that it would be hard to socialize and i thought it'd be again just people would judge me and people, you know, some probably do but I, I think invariably mostly people are just like well up for you doing better and um and actually, most of the time, it probably shines a light on how people on people's own relationship yeah. with drinking, which is why they sometimes react badly because it's like suddenly they realize they've had four drinks while waiting for you to get to the pub, yeah. and you're not drinking. Yeah. So that oh damn, actually now I've got to, I've t- taken all this cash out, and I've now got to spend it all on myself or find yeah. something to spend it on. Um, yeah, I think, um, and I, I've, I think I've said this before, but. Um, The, the like the blast radius of my bad decisions was pretty bad and you know pretty big um but thankfully the blast radius of my good ones is way bigger mm. um because you passively help people when you're sober even talking about it when like just the way that you are in the street just the way you are even in like say in a pub not drinking you cannot help but be better to people um if you're recovering from a problem like that and mm. you're doing your best and you're trying um it's it can only it can only be a positive to those around even when it doesn't feel good yeah. um because that's almost that's almost more valuable if it doesn't feel great and you're still trying and still doing well um getting through it talking about it um 
you're doing a service to yourself but you, and in turn doing a service to people around you um, yeah. Uh, I, I've I've never once I've never once regretted being sober nor leaving a party early. No, nah, no, nah, and and you yeah. do when you're sober, like you're done by about ten o'clock. Like when the guy starts leaning on it's you, the best. But it's the best. It's the best. It is, like, right, I love right. just leaving. I. It is a discipline thing though as well. So it's like it's not like I I just go to places. I mm. I don't just do all the things I used to do and not drink or take mm. drugs. It's like actually I choose where I go way more, you know, um, deliberately. Mm. Um, and also regardless of kind of what I do or where I go, if I'm out for like a if something in the evening, an hour and a half, two hours max, and I'm gone. Yeah. Um, because really, there's not even if I'm seeing people that I really want to see it's like if I really want to see us again um this might be an interesting evening but there'll be others um yeah. it's like even if I don't catch you to say goodbye I'm going to be going um I I and it's, it, that's what helped me get through touring um I did the whole world tour with gorillas last year which was really good well I mean the tour was amazing um but it was good for me to test my sobriety um I made it through um but one of the things that I had to do was like, I'm not going to hang around at like a music venue for the booze after a gig for like three hours. Yeah. Like, no, I'm why, why, why? Like, I'm going to go. I pretty much leave as soon as I play in general, or if I'm hanging out, it's maybe an hour tops. Um, and if I'm going out with people, etc., I'm going to chip off after around a half or two hours. It's just like, um, cause I also realized my social battery, I need to be quite sparing with um yeah obviously i need it for work i need to be i need to be on for work um so outside i need i, I need to make time for myself um alone as well as time for um other people but be quite deliberate as to how much i give because again you you weaken yourself if you keep if you stretch yourself if you um get stressed if you get tired unnecessarily um, and again, if you're not being authentic, if you're just staying out for the sake of staying out and like putting this pressure on yourself to per, to keep performing, yeah, um, they, I mean, it, uh, it cracks. You're you're right, you know. And and going back to like you know that decision as well to to go sober, it's like there is an inherent selfishness that comes with with being an addict, <laughs> like and that you don't you don't necessarily know of until after the case, and you look back and you regret a few things and you think, oh, could have done this a bit differently, things like that. It doesn't really, like, when we want to go sober, when we're concerned about our behaviour, we go around and we ask everybody what they think and, you know, um, do, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? But actually, ultimately, what's important is your relationship with alcohol. If you're unhappy with mm -hmm. it and it's making mm -hmm. you feel a certain way, that is enough to make a decision. 100%. Like, not, asking other people, mm. am I an addict, yeah. isn't that valuable uh yeah or, or yeah i shouldn't say that because maybe some people they just know mm. it's a, it's a good it's good to be asking the question mm. but the answer doesn't come from elsewhere yeah. um it's 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 a good it's a good question to ask yourself it's just like well look at your relationship with this thing it's like when's the last time you didn't do it um yeah. when's the last time you what's the, when's the last yeah. time you enjoyed yourself not yeah. doing it do you have to which do i it? think is actually <laughs> Yeah. yeah yeah like and and what what do you do when you feel like you have to yeah. do you ever not and still feel yeah. all right um i actually think yeah a good question to ask yourself is like especially so for example with drinking when's the last time you had fun without drinking mm. and like mm. if you can't really answer that question maybe it's time to start thinking about that's what's that on. that is a you're so right because i i held um I live in Cornwall in the UK mm. and um, I held along with uh, a few others um, at the first sober soiree, the first sober event in Cornwall. And I had a lot Sweet. of people inquire about it. And one of the things they said, they said to me, I'm just not sure I could go out without drinking. And I said, you know what, whether you drink or you don't drink, whether you get drunk or you don't get drunk, whatever, that that's, you know, I've got no sort of real strong feelings towards it. If you drink, you drink. Mm -hmm. If you don't, you don't. That's fine. But the idea that you can't do something without it, that's that's an int that's a shame i think it's problematic yeah yeah um and it, it just shows that it's it's not really 
then you're not in control really yeah um yeah it's it's i mean what else do you say that about what else has that kind of good question like if yeah. it, i'm still going out if, if i've got something to do and it's raining i'm still going to go out yeah. after, uh, i get an umbrella out it's like yeah. if it's snowing if it's hailing it's just like if the train's not working i'm i'll find another way to get there it's just like if i if i go out and there's not booze there hmm. surely there's another way to enjoy yourself like this sh- sh- like how could there not be yeah um, no you're right you're absolutely right i mean that's one of the things like like i said to you right right in the middle of that was freedom i got freedom from it you know and uh i think i think a lot of these things um you know circumnavigate lots of different things but one of the things is you have to take action and i think that mm-hmm. what you did was amazing you took action it would have been really hard there's no doubt about that you know it would have been Terrible. really 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 hard <laughs> I don't recommend it. Well, no, I, te- I technically do, but it's like ideally you wouldn't want you want to get to that point where you need to do something. It was a very drastic, yeah, thing. But it just speaks to the sort of headspace you were potentially in at the time, really, um, for you to feel like that was needed. But I mean, we, we're going to need to wrap it up. You're a busy chap. Um, I've got one little question, just curious, mm-hmm. and then um, we'll close up with a, a little bit of guidance from you. Um, one of them is I, I've heard in a few like conversations you've had with people that you said you referred to yourself as a people pleaser. And I said, like, yeah. and I'm just wondering, how's that going? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I'm I still I still am. But it's also. So here's a, 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 another thing sort of linked to sobriety. You really get to know. Um, when you stop drinking, it, actually, you realize I, I didn't realize how much like being out and stuff like burned me socially. Like I actually have a lot of a smaller bandwidth for doing it. I'm good at socializing and I do enjoy it. Um, but actually I would only stay out for hours and hours and hours because I could drink or there was still drugs or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like being a people pleaser on like would just make me do things that I didn't want to do. I do it way, way, way less now. Um, but I still think, do you know what it's actually only really it, the main thing it really affects for me now is my music like i'm working on new solo stuff and i haven't released any solo music for like 10 years that's um, exciting yeah i'm really excited i'm really really nervous about it as well um which again kind of probably says i'm stepping in the right direction yeah. um but i think so much one of the things that stopped me from releasing stuff so much was like i would think oh, what would this person think of this song if I wrote it like that? Or what would this person think? And like having some of these friends who are amazing songwriters, it's like, oh, Damon wouldn't like that. Oh, he'd probably, you know, Kate even like that. Or, you know, whoever wouldn't like this. It's just like all these random thoughts. just like, and then I start writing a song to maybe appease a certain type of person or uh, that that sounds a bit like a certain artist because my friends are well into that guitarist or, you know, stuff like that, that which is really crippling. Um, is sort of part of this sort of identity crisis I had sort of getting sober um but what I'm finding and it's taken a lot of time and it's taken a lot of work is that this is the first I'm finally in a place where I'm I feel really confident about what I'm doing now and I feel like I'm doing it from the right yeah. right place um and I know I mean I know I'm not going to please everyone and, I, and regardless of what those people I, I mentioned you know think it's still my my thing and i think anybody i admire actually got to where they have gotten to by doing what they wanted to do regardless of how other people feel um regardless of the result like yeah but it's actually more important it's just like at the very least to be able to hold my hand up at the end of the day being like i'm proud of that um and you know I'm, i'm well into that so i'm trying to deprogram those people pleasing things like just saying no to things like, yeah, yeah. Which, good start <laughs> yeah it's a great no it really really is yeah, i is, say yeah. yes to everything i say yes to everything before and disappoint most people because i was flaky because I, again i was in a shambles i'd be up all night get an hour's sleep and then have to get on the tube and be somewhere for rehearsal forget mm. my guitar or you know all it was just chaos it's a mess um and most of the things that you went, you feel the pressure to do. It's just like you don't have to. Like I don't have to to link up with this person. I don't have to um, go to the studio and do this session, whatever. But if I've said yes to it and leave it to the last minute and say no and say I'm not coming or flake out, that's not good either. 
it's just like being respectful of people other people's time and being respectful of yourself as well and be like am I really going to do this do I really want to do this I'm trying to be more honest with myself for, in terms like that and it's, it's a small thing but actually that actually has far broader reaching effects than you think probably yeah I mean it, it's not a small thing what I can hear for what it's worth is it sounds like you're starting to validate your authenticity and you're realizing that 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 authenticity is evolutionary you know it, it's mm. ever changing you know as you learn you learn you learn it's a bit like an algorithm isn't it it's like an algorithm mm. learns, yeah, yeah. And learns and learns and learns and learns and as it learns it changes due to the things it's learning you know and uh it sounds like yeah. that's what you're doing um and it's you know i've got no doubt like i genuinely am excited about the idea of you making your own music and i think that it it almost obviously has to be like coming from you otherwise what's the point right <laughs> you know if, if yeah, it's not your true. music you know and i don't think that's what excites me about it I, it's just that like this is going to be this genuine authentic version of you out there you know you you've obviously got this deep emotional connection uh and way of expressing yourself through music and that's what music is you know it is a form Try. of expression and i can't wait to hear it man it's going to be amazing so oh man thank you yeah. I'll, I'll i'll definitely let you know yeah, no, definitely. Sure comes out. So, like, sometime this year. Oh wow, gosh, good. That, that's even better. I look forward to that. I, I really will. Uh, let me know, man. <laughs> let me know. For um, sure, for sure. So, is there anything you'd like to pass on that you feel could help people with their self development? Just before we finish. So yeah, so not not uh, not necessary sobriety, I guess, but if there's anything that I'm really, really learning at the moment is not shying away from the conversations and just the things in your life that make you the most uncomfortable, because unfortunately the only way out is through those things. Oh. The only way out of whatever it is you're feeling, the only way out of, because the, the more you avoid them, the more that whatever that harbors, comes out sideways um it will come out, it will it will express itself mm. no matter what you do because feelings don't just disappear like it's going to come out but you don't have any control over over it so i would say if you're if there's a difficult conversation you need to have do it sooner than rather later if there's i don't know if there's some forms you need to fill in that you've been avoiding because it's going to be long you need to carve out some time to do that and ask for help if you need, if you need, because, you know, as I, as I also say, life is a team sport and you can't do it on your own, whether it's sobriety or whether it's anything. Um, so if you need to do something difficult, ask for help to do it. But unfortunately, there's no getting around doing it. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a really, it's a, it's a big one. I think it's kind of applicable to a lot of things, but um do the difficult thing that is uh that's perfect that is great that's really good self-development advice um that you can apply to actually think you can apply that to everything mm -hmm. <laughs> so so you nailed that <laughs> yeah, nice one. Yeah. so so um just just to finish last thing what's next for you and where can people find you um what's next for me um I'm actually off to Malawi on Sunday to make music with a project called The Very Best to a good friend of mine. And we're sort of a, um, we got a singer from Malawi, a Swedish producer, guitarist from LA and myself. And we, we haven't made a record for a long time, so I'm doing that. I'm going on tour with Katie Tunstall coming up um, starting in February uh, and like sort of 16th, 17th of February, a few dates, three dates in Europe. And then it's a UK going all over the UK and Scotland. So um, yeah, I definitely highly recommend you coming to that. It's going to be a great band. Kate Tunstall, Andy Burrows from Razor Light on drums, myself. It's a pretty good band, um, uh, I would say. Um, Sounds it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I'm going straight from that to play Coachella with Gorillaz. So um, it's a pretty, uh, Got a few things pretty on. interesting start to the year um but yeah just find me on uh at share music s-e-y-e -E music um that's where you get updates for what's coming up and uh yeah anything i got going on yeah amazing listen share it's been fantastic you know there's been so many amazing little bits of wisdom in there 
and uh yeah i can't wait for people to hear this so thank you so much for your time hey thank you for having me have a great great day bro